This is Mark Lewis, and I'm glad you've joined me again today to talk about the Jewish-Gentile controversy. We, this is the fourth series, fourth in a series, of uh, discussions, lectures, that are triggered by Acts 15.5. And in it, it says that certain ones of the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said to a congregation of the early church, church leaders in Jerusalem, all the apostles and elders were there, and said, it is necessary to circumcise the Gentiles who are coming to Christ and to require them to keep the Mosaic law. So we're going to look at that, hopefully today, <laughs> in at least the next session. Maybe we'll start on it with this session, but I doubt it. I want to set it up. I want to set, we want to look at Acts 15. I want to set it up. I want to give the background. Now, I gave a broad brush background of, uh, in previous, a previous time, of um, Jewishness, what that meant, and the DNA of a Jew. And then we looked at prophecies about the Gentiles coming to God in the last days via the Messiah. And we noted that, um, it wasn't abundantly clear how that would happen. So now, what I want to do is, instead of looking at the Old Testament, I actually want to pick up at where, just before Christ was ascended, and he gave his marching orders to the church, and kind of trace through Acts, the first 15 chapters, roughly. Now, you know that Jesus gave the Great Commission to his apostles, and what he says is, I want you to go to all the nations, preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, and teaching them to observe whatever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you to the end of the age. That's in Matthew, Matthew 28. And of course, as I said before, they were all Jews. Jesus had a policy. He says, go to the Jew first. One occasion there was a Gentile that confronted him to and said, please heal my daughter. She's cruelly demon-possessed. Jesus said, I've only been sent to the lost tribe of Israel. He almost sent her away if it wasn't for her pernicious, uh, pers persevering faith and determination. And he finally healed her daughter. But on first pass, he rebuffed. He said, no, this is what I am about. I am sent to the lost tribes of Israel. And that's a command he likewise gave to his apostles, even while they were still with him. Go nothing but to the tribe, to the, you know, to the children of Israel. But just before he left, he made it very clear that now he was opening it up and they were to go to all nations, read Gentiles into that, and bring them to Christ. Teach them his commandments. Another passage that talks about this is, of course, Luke. Luke gives a, the Great Commission. I, I really like the way Luke frames it. I don't know, maybe there was more than one time that Jesus said this, but it doesn't sound like it. He said, it says in, uh, this is Luke 24, then he opened their minds, the apostles' minds, so they could understand the scriptures. Because just in the verse before, I should have started with that, verse 44, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you for my death. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And really that sums it all up, doesn't it? There's the Old Testament. We call the Old Testament today. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ, the Messiah, will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, Gentiles, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city, Jerusalem, until you've been clothed with power from on high. <laughs> Gives me goosebumps just to read it. <laughs> it 
So here's the commission. It's simple. But you know what? You read the first part of Acts, and that's exactly what they're doing. After they're filled with the Spirit, they start reaching out to their fellow Jews. In fact, when the Spirit fell, which is on Pentecost, yeah, let's let's turn to that. Acts, Acts 2 5. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. This is just before, or just, uh, it's the background for Pentecost. Every nation. Because you see in the Torah, males were commanded, if they were of age, were commanded to come to Jerusalem three times a year. Doesn't matter how far away you are. Um, sometimes it's tough being a Jew. <laughs> but somehow the God blessed them where they were able to do it. And so throughout the empire, people would come. Men would come to keep those three feasts. And this particular feast was the Feast of uh, Pentecost. It was uh, 50 days after the Passover, the Jewish Passover. So all these men come from all over the world. Now, this is part of God's strategy. Because you remember I, I said he chose the Jews. He shaped and formed the Jews. And he made them separate from the nations, from the Gentiles. For a purpose. And then he scattered them. <laughs> over the whole world he scattered them. Jews were in every nation of the earth and in every major city of the ancient world. Jews practiced their faith. Sincere, God-fearing Jews practiced their faith. So, have you ever looked at a dandelion that was, that was ripe and mature? Just right? You pick it as a child, I remember doing it, and you put it up and you go, you watch the seeds fly. That's what we've got here. That's what we've got here. God is using his people as he planned to reach the world. To bring the world back to him. And Jews in those early days were central to that whole plan. And later on we'll find out how that they still are pretty central. At least in the very end times. So here they go. And you know, you know how Peter preached. Many people were converted just in one day. Many Jews, godly Jews, were. They realized that they had crucified the Christ, the Messiah that they were looking for. Well, fast forward to. Uh, well, let's see. How about let's look at um. Let's look at three chapter three. 3,000 men were saved that first day. Very shortly after, he calls out 5,000 that were saved. But anyway, after the healing of the beggar, and I'm not going to repeat the story, but I want you to notice how Peter talks to his fellow Jews. And frankly, if you want to be successful in reaching out to Jews and to tell them about their Messiah, this is a good protocol what he does here he models for us how to talk to a devout Jew now brothers I know you acted in ignorance as did your leaders but this is how God fulfilled what he foretold through all the prophets saying that his Christ his anointed one would suffer repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who's been appointed for you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he says to you. Anyone who doesn't listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. 
Indeed, all the prophets, from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. <laughs> and you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, Jesus, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Wow. Wow. That, you know, when Peter was preaching, he was saying things that resonated for every God-fearing Jew. He touched them deep. This is the language that we should use, really, as Gentiles, when we're trying to reach Jews for Christ. Hmm. Well, I tell you, lots of Jews came to the Lord. As a matter of fact, it says, uh, well, well, even as early as chapter 2, verse 47, it says, they were praising God after their conversion and enjoying the favor of all the people. What people? Well, the Jewish people in Jerusalem. You see, they saw something in those early disciples that they liked. There was joy. There was love. There was a transformed life. There was evidence of the very Holy Spirit on them. I mean, they were conscientious. They were devout Jews. They went to the temple more than ever. They tithe more than ever. They give, they gave to the poor more than ever. They prayed more than ever. And they prayed from their heart. <laughs> they kept the festivals more than ever. They didn't become Gentiles. They became Jews. Let me give you an illustration. You know gloves? You know how you put on gloves? I got gloves here. And it, you put your hand in the glove, and a good glove that fits your hand, it just your hand will fill up the glove. And the glove just completely surrounds your hand. And there shouldn't be too much gap. This is the way Christ, the Messiah Jesus, was to the Jews. This, he was the fulfillment of everything that was talked about in the Old Testament, in their holy books. He was everything that had been promised to Abraham. Everything made sense to them now. Whereas some of them were kind of lackadaisical about practicing their faith, there was a sect among them that was devout, the Pharisees. But many Jews were, well, kind of like Jews today. You got a wide spectrum of practice and devotion to their ancient faith. But nonetheless, those who came to Christ really became real Jews. And they had favor. They had favor with all their Jewish brethren at the first who were watching on. But, you know, you know what happened. Difficult times started to come. Yeah, jealousy. Apostles were thrown into prison pretty soon by the leadership because they were teaching. They were teaching things they weren't supposed to be teaching, that Jesus was the Christ. Well, guess what? If Jesus was the Christ, who killed him? Their leaders were instrumental in that. And they beat the apostles thoroughly at one occasion and said, We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name anymore. You have put this blood on us. <laughs> well, he goes on and says, we must obey God rather than man. Anyway, in the first few chapters of Acts, you see the church just busting out. It says many of the priests became obedient. Yeah. Now, do you think they quit, became, quit being priests when they were converted? No. <laughs> They did their job as priests with even more spiritual insight and more of a heart in it 
than ever before. They saw things in the sacrificial system, in the temple itself, that they'd never seen. Their mind was opened. Because Christ, Christ opened the minds of the apostles on more than one occasion. And he continued to do that through the teaching of the apostles in the first century church. Hey, it was an exciting time. If you love God's words, you would have loved those times. To hear the apostles, to go to the temple every day to hear them. That's where they taught from. It was right there in the smack in the center of the temple. They, not in the center, but you know, in, in the places where they could, they were prescribed and they would teach their brethren from sun up to sundown practically. They never ceased to, it says, preach and teach Jesus. Well, so that's pretty exciting. Well, you kind of fast forward on and to this guy, uh, Stephen. And uh, again, it was jealousy. The, uh, some of the Jews got really jealous. He, he was working miracles. He was speaking and teaching uh, and bringing many of his fellow Jews to Jesus the Messiah. And certain ones that set up a particular synagogue, and I assume that was a very devout, yeah, devout synagogue. It was a synagogue of freedmen, that's what it says. So they were probably, I'm guessing, zealots of some sort. They were um, really hostile against anybody who would forsake Jewishness. And they, they spoke against him and brought him in before the Sanhedrin. And basically they said, this man is teaching against the temple, teaching of Jesus who told us to forsake these customs. Well, of course, Jesus didn't. So anyway... You know what happened. They, all eyes were fixed on him. His face glowed like an angel. And he basically told them, well, God did choose you. But you've had a habit of rejecting him, even though you're chosen. And you have a habit, those stoning prophets. <laughs> and, you know, God doesn't really, he kind of yawns about the temple. You, you're making out to be more than what, you know, than what it might be. You're, 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 you, you think it's not quite right here. Because he doesn't, he's not limited to that temple. <laughs> well, anyway, and he says, furthermore, you crucified your Messiah by this time. And they stoned him. And one of the key instigators of that event was a man named Saul. This is the man that God has appointed and made an apostle to the Gentiles. We do not know and have not heard of any apostle before then being an apostle to the Gentiles. Because all 12 were Jews. Well, Paul was too. But they were apostles to the Jews. So we pick up on uh, Paul's conversion shortly after that, after he gets converted. And how he gets converted is that he's breathing out threats and he's, he's going after believing Jews. We call them Christians now. They didn't call them Christians then, but they were disciples of Jesus. They were Jews, though. And he goes and he has letters to the synagogues. This, I'm, I'm looking at verse 9, verse uh, 2. He gets these letters from Jerusalem, from the hierarchy, the Jewish hierarchy back in Jerusalem. And basically he's got permission to find these Jews who are followers of Jesus and chain them up and take them back to Jerusalem and try them there. It's kind of a scary deal, actually. And Paul was fierce about this. He was fully committed to doing this. And to great uh, sacrifice to himself, he went large distance to Damascus, not in Palestine, it's north of there, in what's now Syria. So anyway, he's on his way, and it says in verse 2, it says, and he asked for letters from the high priest, 
and there were two of the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, where would they be found? In the synagogues. Here's what you got to understand. When you came to Christ, you were in the way. Is what they, that there was a way. That's the way they referred to it in the early days. And you did not automatically leave the synagogue. And you for sure didn't leave your Jewish life. Mm -hmm. And the Jews and the believing Jews still participated to the extent they could if they were near Jerusalem in the temple worship. They still participated in the synagogues throughout the dispersion. Becoming a Christian in that day did not mean leaving your Jewish faith. <laughs> it meant you filled up your faith, just like this glove, with meaning and purpose and loyalty and passion. Yeah. The best Jews of the day were, quote, Christian Jews, followers of the way. And frankly, on one hand, it caused admiration. On another hand, it caused jealousy. Because, as I said, the DNA of a Jew is they're chosen. And, you know, it kind of feels like if you're all enthused about Jesus as the Messiah, that you've broken solidarity with most Jews. And this became exceedingly painful over the years into that first century. It, um, well, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So anyway, after this part, after Stephen got stoned, it says the Christians were scattered that lived in Jerusalem. All these believers in, in Messiah left. Not all of them, but many of them did. And what it says, the text says something to the effect, um, the 12, though, remained in Jerusalem. Those those who had been scattered, see, how does it, hmm, just a part, pardon me. Verse, this is after uh, Stephen's death, verse uh, chapter 8, verse 2. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Those who had been scattered preached wherever they went. And so you, you have here, from here on, you, you, have you had a water bottle? Um, you know, those of you who go running or jogging or go out and, you know, when it's hot in the summer, you have a water bottle and you fill it with ice and it sweats. It, it leaks. Well, that's what the early church did. It leaked. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, they probably did go out under command. But the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. And they were the ones that were given the Great Commission, right? Personally. But they stayed in Jerusalem. But you got these other Christians that through persecution are scattered. And what do they do? They share their faith. And Acts 8 is about Philip sharing with Samaritans who were half Jews the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they were being baptized. And finally, Peter and Paul, who were apostles, had to come down and pray for them to lay their hands on them. And you say, well, for them to receive the Holy Spirit. You say, well, why is that? The text does not directly say. I suspect that the Jews back home had problems with that, with Samaritans who are half Jew in a way. Yeah, they're half Jews. They're considered half Jews, half priests, receiving the gospel. That seems to... Samaritans aren't really kosher. They aren't exactly full-fledged, Torah-observing Jews. But the gospel went to them. And the early church, the way God orchestrated it, he sent two of his primary apostles to lay hands upon them. And then they received the Holy Spirit. Think of the impact on the Jewish church. 
as they began to process that. <laughs> there are two main leaders laying hands, going to a Samaritan village, and where Philip, one of their stars, has been preaching and doing mighty miracles and baptized, and, and they lay hands on and receive the Holy Spirit. That's, wow, that's something. Now I'm going to take you up, yes, to Cornelius. I want to I wanna do more with Cornelius. I want to tell you a little bit more about it because this is a pivotal story in the Jewish and Gentile controversy. It's pivotal. Literally, Cornelius is an icon to the church and has been ever since. I want to talk about that. I want to set that up. As part of the setup for Acts 15, oh no, I'm taking way too long, aren't I? <laughs> I hope you're enjoying it anyway, because I sure am. So I will sign off now, but I'll come back. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about Cornelius, and then I promise we'll get into Acts 15. Okay, till next time.